So the most interesting thing about the continuum hypothesis, although it has 8 million hits on Google, it's religiously interesting, it's philosophically interesting, but the most interesting thing about the continuum hypothesis is the light that it sheds on what we can and can't know in mathematics. So oftentimes cultures and people, probably many of you in this room, will turn to mathematics anytime you want a rational and decisive answer when your economics or your philosophy can't give you that answer. Galileo said that the universe cannot be read until we have learned the language and become familiar with the characters in which it is written. It is written in mathematical language, without which means it is humanly impossible to comprehend a single word. So we often rely on these mathematical foundations to understand just about anything, especially in a scientific way. The continuum hypothesis is a simple statement about the number line. The number line, the one that we learned about in third grade. It starts in the middle, it has zero, it extends out to infinity on both sides. It includes all of the numbers, both the counting numbers, one, two, three, and it also includes all of those numbers which take infinitely many decimal places to describe. Pi is one that you all are familiar with. The first person to ever think about what happens at the end of those lines, though, beyond those arrows, was a man named Georg Cantor. He was a German mathematician. He developed these mathematically rigorous ideas of thinking about completed infinities. Before, we had no conception of these completed infinities, and those of you who are familiar with calculus will know that we use infinity as limit points in calculus, and that was pretty much the most rigorous way we had of thinking about any sort of infinity. Cantor, however, developed these ways of thinking about these actual sets of infinity, and he developed ways of thinking about infinitely many of these completed infinite sets. He was met with a lot of skepticism, though. Cantor was a Jew, and the most famous mathematician at the time in Germany, his name was Leopold Kronecker. He was a known anti-Semite. He said, I don't know what predominates in Cantor's theory, philosophy or theology, but I am sure that there is no mathematics there. It was particularly a low blow on Kronecker's part because he was perpetuating these ideas of a Jewish mathematics, that Jewish mathematicians were somehow different than Christian mathematicians. And this was a reason he got the religious community involved, and Cantor never achieved any position of, of merit, even though his ideas completely revolutionized fields of mathematics. Cantor wasn't discouraged, though. Cantor pressed on, and he developed a way of comparing sizes of infinity. So if we think about it at the finite level, if I want to know if the set of shoes that I have and the set of feet that I have are the same size, I'll say, well, I want to put a shoe on every foot, and if I don't have any shoes left over, then I have the same number of shoes as I have feet. Well, Cantor applied this same idea to the infinite. So my claim to you is that there are actually more real numbers those are all of the numbers which take infinitely many decimal places to describe. Then there are natural numbers, the counting numbers, one, two, three, four, five. So some of you might say, well, of course, you know, there are real numbers in between all the natural numbers. And then some of you might say, but, some, but both of them are infinite. How could there be more than the other? Well, I'm going to show you a proof, and I want you to use that same idea of the one-to-one -one correspondence in this proof. So I want you to pretend like we can have this one-to-one -one correspondence between the natural numbers and the real numbers. I've just listed some random ones there, but you can imagine that there would be any of them. And then in your brains, I want you to circle the first digit of the first number listed, the second digit of the second number listed, and so on. I want you to add one in your brain to every single one of those numbers that you just circled in your head. We get a new number, we call it the diagonal number. It's that one going down the diagonal, so it's the 10,000th digit of the, of the 10,000th member on our list. And if it were to occur on our list, remember we said that we had included all of the possible real numbers, it would have to occur at somewhere on our list. It would have to have some natural number corresponding to it. So let's say it was the 10,000th place. Well, we know that we added one to the 10,000th number we listed at the 10,000th digit in order to get our diagonal number. So we know that it differs exactly at the 10,000th digit from the 10,000th number that's listed. So it can't be on our list. It can be nowhere on our list. So we have this number that's not on our list, even though we assumed that we had listed all of them. So now we know that there are more natural numbers 
than there are real numbers. If you didn't get that, don't tune out. You'll still get something from the talk. So the continuum hypothesis is stating nothing more than is there some set which has more members than the natural numbers and fewer members than the real numbers. It's a really easy statement to understand if you're familiar with mathematics. So this story is sort of two stories. Cantor was doing his work in the late 19th century. We're going to meet another guy named Godleb Frege who is also doing his work in the late 19th century. He was interested in a different kind of thing. Frege was interested in establishing rigorous foundations for arithmetic. In geometry, we have Euclid's postulates. We know a finite number of sentences for why everything in geometry is the way that it is. Frege was interested in a similar project for arithmetic. Frege published a book called The Basic Laws of Arithmetic. He thought that he had found a system for proving all statements of arithmetic. Sadly, in 1903, he received a letter from Bertrand Russell, an Englishman. Uh, <laughs> Russell wrote Frege of a paradox that he had found in his system. Some of you may be familiar with the paradox. It's called Russell's paradox. And in Frege's system, he didn't account for different sets containing themselves. He allowed for this to happen. Turns out this is not a good thing. Uh, Russell's paradox asks, if P is the set, which, set of all sets which do not contain themselves, does P contain itself? So P would contain itself if and only if P didn't contain itself. A system can't really allow for these types of things. So this absolutely devastated Frege. He never was able to recover. He started writing some nonsense. I think he converted to Christianity after that. I mean, <laughs> it was... <laughs> anyway, Rus Russell didn't give up on the project, though. He and a man named Alfred North Whitehead published what they called the Principia Mathematica. It's not, not Newton's Principia, but in this Principia, they were, it was two volumes, and they were trying to figure out why arithmetic is true. On page 379, they proved that 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. <laughs> so they were leaving nothing up to intuition here. They really wanted a rigorous foundation. <laughs> <laughs> Laugh all you want. <laughs> but so after Russell, they spent 12 years writing the first volume of this. It had been so heavily invested, 26 years to do the entire thing. But a man <laughs> named Kirk Riddell, he um, he was able to prove not only in Principia Mathematica was there a sentence of arithmetic that was, a, was unable to be proved, but for any system that could explain to us why arithmetic was true, there's going to be some sentence of arithmetic that is neither provable to be true or false. So this absolutely destroyed Russell. He was <laughs> not doing well when, <laughs> when he read Gödel's paper. The sentence, though, it didn't bother other mathematicians so much, because the sentence looked something like, I am not provable in Principia Mathematica. So they asked the question, like, why would we really ever want to ask if that thing is true or not? So they weren't too bothered. You know, the algebraists kept doing their algebra, and the analysts kept analyzing. And while all this was going on, it's really sad, um, Georg Cantor passed away. And it's really a shame that he wasn't around in 1940 when Kirk Riddell, same dark horse, was able to prove the simple, in the simple statement of the continuum hypothesis that we can't disprove it. So he didn't prove it. He didn't prove that anything was true. It was a new kind of proof, and we proved that, that we would never know that it was false. So <laughs> kind of confusing, right? And no one made any progress on this. We had no new way of constructing proofs in this way. Gödel sort of revolutionized the system until a man named Paul Cohen was totally hungry for power in the mathematical community. <laughs> and he was trained as an analyst, but he wanted to get famous. And so he chose logic. He didn't think there were any smart logicians. And he went up in the halls of Berkeley, who, which is the logic mecca, and he asked a mathematician, who's now nowhere near as famous as he is, what the biggest question in mathematical logic was, what the biggest open question was. Of course, the man responded, the independence of the continuum hypothesis. But you shouldn't work on that, because there's no new way, and there's really no clear way to go. Well, Cohen wasn't discouraged. He was really, really power-hungry guy. 
And um, he constructed this revolutionary way of constructing models, of proving things in mathematics. Totally changed a lot of fields, topology being one, set theory being one. But he was able to prove in 1963 that we couldn't prove the continuum hypothesis. <laughs> so <laughs> Gödel proved that we couldn't disprove it. Cohen proved that we couldn't prove it. So now we've got this sentence that you guys can understand with very little mathematical training. There are things that we can prove that are way more complicated that I studied for four years and I still can't understand what they're asking. So the continuum hypothesis simply stated, is there any set which has more members than the natural numbers and fewer members than the real numbers? And mathematics can't answer it. It's totally independent of mathematics. So I'll leave you with a quote. All of our surest statements about the nature of the world are mathematical statements. Yet we do not know what mathematics is. And so we find that we have adopted a religion strikingly similar to many traditional faiths. Change mathematics to God and little else might change. Thank you.